Hello and welcome back to Dark Britain. Today's topic is a very exciting one um, and one that originally drew me to the idea of the podcast with Zach. So um, when me and Zach met at the Early Researchers Conference, he told me about this and his work on it with the MA topic. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Zach. Please tell us what you're going to be talking about today. Well, uh, the title of the episode, uh, The British Cult That Worshipped Hitler, it sounds wow. like clickbait, really. Um, but this was a group of men and women that set up a church in Surrey to worship Hitler as the second coming of Christ. They were called <laughs> the League of Christian Reformers. They worshipped Hitler at their altar wrote letters to the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, and the Chief Rabbi, and even penned their own version of the Bible called the Holy Book of Adolf Hitler. And like you mentioned, I studied this uh, for my MA, but it actually starts back in my undergrad, because I did my dissertation wow. project on the Holocaust, and I read a random article about these people uh, and was shocked Ooh. and amazed and baffled by people who could believe this um, and so I started looking into them did it for my undergrad dissertation and then used that research into the MA as well so I've been studying these people for a while so in mm. some ways I feel like I know them which is slightly concerning <laughs> for sure you know it's really exciting and as you say so under research so I'm really glad that we're sharing their story today um, more for awareness than, you know, we're proud of them, as with everyone yes, in of course. dark history. But um, why don't you just give us a little bit of context? Like, where did they come from? How did they start? Um, what's mm. the time period? Yeah, so our time period is the Second World War. We start uh, in 1939 and then we go until 1945. So it's literally just the years of the war. By the end of 1945, mm -hmm. the League were gone. This cult had disappeared from the record uh, so it was literally those years wow um, but we can actually start a little bit earlier with oswald mosley in 1932 when he set up the british union of fascists um, and it was in this group the buf that all the members of the league would find their beginnings everyone in the league of christian reformers was a part of the buf and most of them were actually personal friends of oswald mosley himself uh, which is really interesting but the buf mm, sure. wasn't they... the only prominent fascist organization in britain at the time uh, you had others like the link who were looking to try and build friendship with germany during the war and you had the nordic mm. league who were really violent they were the most oh virulent pro-nazi organization in britain at the time and they used some really extreme measures um, and each member of the League played a part in those groups as well. So they were pretty impassioned fascists, it has to be said. Mm, for sure. And I think the thing is, with the war, the home front always gets sort of laughed at, doesn't it? You know, you think Dad's army. But if you have these threats from within Britain, it, it gets pretty serious, right? And as you say, they're all personal friends. There's a real echo chamber. So they all yep. think they're doing the right thing. It's, it's terrifying, actually. Exactly. And, and this is what the government started to see as well. They started mm -hmm. to get concerned that there would be some fifth column spies in the country who would <laughs> seek to destroy Britain from within. And so mm -hmm. in 1939, they brought out a piece of legislation called Regulation 18B. And basically yep. that meant that the government could intern, they could arrest and intern anyone without trial that they saw as a threat to the country or potentially an agent of the enemy nation and mm -hmm. every single one of the members of the league once again was wrapped up in this each of them was arrested and sent to peveril internment camp on the isle of man wow yeah, that's, that's not too dissimilar met. from the in what in the prison yeah <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. I was going to say the uh, the regulation is not too dissimilar from the um, Defense of the Realm Act in the First World War, which mm. was sort of like intelligence and worry. And so it's good to see these continuities and, you know, not so good to see that you still get these groups of people linking up in these camps. 
you know, maybe they should have been kept separate. I don't know. So who else was involved in this? Who were the members other than Oswald Mosley, who I know you've already mentioned? Mm. So Oswald Mosley, like you say, uh, the founder of the British Union of Fascists, um, kind of mm-hmm. the big fascist, the well-known fascist in the country. And while the BUF was the starting point for every member of the League, Oswald Mosley himself was never actually a member of the League. So ah. the members of the League, all these guys who met each other in the internment camp. We have Thomas St. Barb Baker. He was kind okay. of the true mastermind behind the group. He was the, the head of the group. And he became a prominent member of the British Union of Fascists and was close personal friends with Oswald Mosley himself. When mm. Regulation 18B came into force and he realised that he was being hunted by MI5, uh, he went mm. on the run. And he had a Hot. really distinctive walrus moustache. And while he was on the run, he shaved it off to try and disguise himself um, from the authorities. Unfortunately... Yeah, that would work. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Unfortunately for him, and probably fortunately for the government, uh, he was arrested. And he was finally sent to Peveril internment camp, where he would spend Mm. the rest of the war. Um, Mm. He was actually one of the last to be released from the Regulation 18B internment camps, even after Oswald Mosley himself, uh, which is... No way. Which is interesting. Yeah. So before he'd been interned, he'd been kind of a real proper fascist, really fanatical. He went so far as to think that a birthmark on his baby's forehead was a swastika. Oh, rip. That's yeah, terrible. He's, he's, he's a very interesting guy Um, imagine being married to him well exactly exactly his wife (laughs) uh started to distance herself from him realizing that he was slightly deranged uh with his beliefs in hitler (laughs) believing that his own son was the reincarnation of hitler somehow um and the heir to hitler's third reich throne or something Ah. like that and so she filed for divorce uh, and left him behind which is no small thing in in the forties and fifties, right? It's a pretty it's a pretty serious thing to do. So good on her for doing that because you know it was a real taboo at the time. So definitely. So what what else happened then at, at Peveril? So interestingly, for Baker, um, lots of rumours started to come to the fore from guards and other inmates that maybe he was just a bit of a con artist. He started to make friends Ah. with people who were rich, people who uh, had good connections outside the camp Mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And that led people to believe that he was a bit of a con artist, only looking for people's money and was only making friends with those people that he could use and manipulate Mm -hmm. for his own gain after the war. And this is where he comes into contact with James Larratt Battersby. Who mm-hmm. was also at the camp. Now, yeah. James Battersby, he has one of the best nicknames um, in all the members of the group and a real kind of villain's nickname. He was known as oh the Mad Hatter. Could be worse. I was expecting, you know, like <laughs> the Death Eater or something. So right. the Mad Hatter, <laughs> why, why did he get that name? Because uh, before the war... And before he was interned, he had grown up in and run Battersby hat firm. So they would make hats and all that kind of stuff. So he was genuinely a hatter and he was slightly mad because he started to believe all these crazy things about Hitler. Such a wholesome start, making hats to then being wrapped up in this. Exactly. Exactly. And this is this is the interesting thing. While I was studying, I had a chance to interview his daughter. Uh, Amanda wow. Hale. Yeah, and little plug, if you want to go and listen to that interview, you can find it Ooh. on the Present History podcast and on the Present History YouTube channel. We, we've we put the whole interview on there. Um, but like you say, it was quite a wholesome start because he was a real family man. Everyone viewed him as a gentleman. And his daughter said that um, some of her memories of what other family members had said about him was that he was actually quite a nice guy. 
which doesn't really add up with what he'd come to believe mm -hmm. about Hitler and all that kind of stuff. So it's an interesting situation. What were her memories of him? Was she quite small or? Yeah, so her memories were basically yeah. just based on what other family members had said. She of had course. met her father um, because there's a photo mm -hmm. of them together, um, but she was really, really young at the time. And so she doesn't have it's any personal removed. recollections of, of her father, yeah. Mm. Um, Possibly a good thing. Are there any other key players or are these the top three? Indeed. So we've got Arthur Schneider and he is okay. kind of the theological fanaticist of mm. the group. Doesn't it sound like a British name? No, exactly. So he was actually mm. an Aus the son of an Austrian immigrant. And so okay. that kind of puts him a little bit on the back foot, given that Austria, Hungary were the enemy mm. in the First World War. Mm. And now um, Austrian people sound like German people uh, because of their accent and stuff like that um, during the Second World War. He also didn't help his case because he was extremely anti-British with his fascism, um, <laughs> saying that the British government were crap and useless and that we should let Germany win, invade us and take control uh, because we weren't doing the job well enough ourselves. So how did he get on with the other fascists then? Because obviously they were pro-Germany, but surely they weren't anti-British. Is it possible to be two at the same time? A know. little bit. A little bit. So he was kind of the anomaly, wanting to um, mm. basically destroy Britain from the inside out. But what, <laughs> what joined these people together was their fascism, like you say. So they found the yeah. common ground of being pro-German, pro-Hitler, uh, and then wanting to bring about this political revolution in their own country as well. So in some ways, yeah, it was it was possible to balance the two, although it's, it's quite difficult. Um, he mm -hmm. had been investigated and hunted by MI5 for years, since 1938. And then he was eventually arrested and taken to Peveril in 1941. Um, mm -hmm. And what's really interesting in the MI5 files is we've got his personal letters that he wrote to his family, where he oh, talks gosh. about all his beliefs and the theology that he's being convinced of by Baker and by Battersby. So when Arthur wow. Schneider meets Baker and Battersby in the internment camp, they start to form this theology together about how Hitler is mm. the second coming of Christ and that Hitler is the tool of God for judgment on earth against the Jewish mammon conspiracy. That's terrible. So where did, where did these guys meet um, before they were put into prison? Did they have a headquarters or anything like that? Uh, before they were put in prison, no. Um, before they, they put... weren't exactly, they weren't friends before uh, prison. And the crazy thing is, is that prison is where they met. And so, while we yeah. were trying to, while the British government were trying to control the threat of fascism by sending these people to internment camps, what they were actually doing was sending people into the perfect environment to grow their beliefs and set themselves up for coming out of these camps at the end of the war more of a threat than they ever were at the beginning. <laughs> it's like the classic rule of prison, right, with gangs, don't send them to the same place. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. Oh, and it gets worse when you, when you realise that the fascist internment camps weren't that far away from the camps in which the British government were housing Jewish immigrants. Oh my goodness, like so mm -hmm. literally saving people and then they're just sort of over here like, hi, that's terrible. Yeah, yeah. Oh. it was it was not a good organisation from the, the British government at all. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, in Peveril, they started building this theology, building these beliefs in the pressure cooker of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And Arthur Schneider wrote back home to his family and managed to convert his entire family other than his wife. His wife was the only one do think, who called it. Do you think called it. they just replied like, yeah, okay, whatever you like. Okay, good, because it's by letter. Like, do we have any more evidence of them actually believing this or is it literally just the correspondence? Just wondering. Yeah, so it's primarily the correspondence, but we do have okay. um, more practical things as well. So we have a letter from Arthur Schneider's wife 
where she's like, mm-hmm. you're crazy. I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure you don't actually believe this. So please stop with all this weird stuff about Hitler. But then we have like some Katie letters. like Katie Hopkins. Yeah, exactly. And we have letters from Arthur's uh, parents, Arthur Schneider's parents. And they're the ones mm-hmm. saying, we read the book that you sent us. Uh, we read the Bible verses that you sent us. And we're starting to believe that you might be right. And so they start to believe. But then the best piece of evidence that we have for their proper conversion to this theology is that Joan and May Schneider, Arthur's sisters, joined him uh, later when he was released from prison at Kingdom House when they formed this cult. So what is Kingdom House? Like, is that... So Kingdom House uh, is a big house, basically. <laughs> it's, it's a, I've, I've been to Kingdom House. And again, a little wow. plug, there's a video on present history. Um, that is a little video about the house as well. So you can see it as well. Whose house was to, it? <laughs> yeah. So, so this house was owned by W.G. Barlow. And he was a famous race really? car driver uh, before the war. Wow. And he was actually really okay. quite successful. Yeah. Um, And he had some underlying fascist beliefs. And so he bought this beautiful house in Surrey to be his retirement home for him and his family. And then when he got arrested and taken to Peveril internment camp, where he then met the other three guys, uh, he was converted to their beliefs and decided to gift this house to these three guys so that they could use it as a headquarters oh. for their cult. He didn't talk to his wife. There was no oh. conversation about it at all. She just rocks up one day and finds that this house has been given to these guys to start a Hitler cult. Oh my gosh. That's divorce straight away, isn't it? This poor woman. <laughs> you and in Surrey so. as well. It's not cheap. Even, even in wartime, that's not cheap at all. So... Can you give me any more on him? Did his wife get converted? Was she literally fuming? <laughs> like, yeah. Any more so on she this? was. She was incredibly angry. But the problem is, understandably, <laughs> we have no idea where she went. She disappeared. <gasps> no idea. That's terrible. Yeah. So her retirement house was taken away from her, and then she disappears from the record. And I haven't been able to find anything in like three years of study. I've never found anything wow. about W.G. Barlow's wife and, and eventually what happened to her. So, If yeah. any of our listeners know anything, you know, I just want to know this woman's okay. Yeah, um, please, that's please terrible. <laughs> An unsolved mystery. Gosh. It is. And so they used Kingdom House, this beautiful house, to set up their Hitler cult. They set up an altar where they would pray and they would worship Hitler. And this altar was set up and next to it were two swastika flags. And then right mm-hmm. by the side of it was a massive, and when I say massive, I mean huge, bust of Hitler's head. Gosh. Yeah. Did Hitler know about this cult or were they just operating, you know, completely independently of him? Weirdly enough, Hitler had no idea. He was dead by the time they actually set up the cult. Yeah. <laughs> it just makes no sense. But then, you know, it, this is a different time and that's their belief, so we'll let them have it. So exactly. what were their beliefs exactly? What did they believe? So they believed that Hitler was the second coming of Christ, that he was mm-hmm. the reincarnation of the, the Son of God, and mm-hmm. that he was the tool that was being used by God to bring judgment on the world that they viewed had Mm -hmm. been corrupted by this massive Jewish conspiracy where the Jews were in control of everything um, and all that kind of stuff. So it was a a really brutal um, theology, a really brutal ideology Mm. to believe that Hitler was not only a tool of judgment, but also Christ himself changed everything about the Christianity that they used to hold on to. Because the original Christianity that they believed in, you believe in Christ, you're saved, that's it. But now you had to believe in Christ to get saved, but then you also had Mm. to believe in Hitler to get saved. And then only after that process would you be saved. 
that's a lot of people to be that you need to be saved by, right? I wonder if yeah. after his death they thought he was still alive. Are they conspiracy theorists? Did they think he went to Argentina, or do they think he was coming <laughs> back? I I don't know. Did they have any practices? Like, did they do anything like you know, sort of a mass or anything like that? Yeah, so on the conspiracy theory kind of thing, we don't know what they believed about mm. whether Hitler went to Argentina <laughs> or anything, but we do know that they believed that the soul of Hitler was immortal. So that Hitler was still alive, even in all the reports of his death. They believed that uh, Hitler was still alive, couldn't die, and that he was this eternal being, the, the son of God. But on their practices... What they would do is they would hold mm. daily prayers at their altar in the little sanctuary of Kingdom House. And they would end each prayer. And when I first read this, it genuinely made me catch my breath. They would end their prayers with, in the name of Adolf Hitler, Amen. Oh, dear. It's, oh, yeah. dear. That, that was one of the first things ever in all my study of history that I've read and gone, wow, that's, that's wild. I bet you were literally trying to write your dissertation on the Holocaust, found this paper and you were like, what? It was a mm. total rabbit hole, I bet. It's just unbelievable. It was, it, it really drew me in, partly because I'm fascinated by Christian theology on the one side mm. and history on the other. And then when you join those two together, <laughs> it's just the just most mind-blowing concoction you can possibly create. Um, and so they actually believed that they were put on earth as ambassadors of the Hitler Christ uh, so that they could go and tell the good news in the biggest inverted commas I can possibly create, the good news <laughs> of Hitler being the saviour and this judgment against uh, the Jewish conspiracy. Yeah. And they went so far as to write letters to the Archbishop of Canterbury uh. telling him, you need to believe what we believe because we're right and we'd love to teach you. And then on top of that, they then wrote to the chief rabbi and told him, uh. we really want to be friends with you and partner with you to convert all the Jewish people to our beliefs so that they can be saved. Did they not think that that would not work with Hitler as the head? Like, <laughs> it just feels feels like to me these guys are idiots. Like, was it literally just them four, or did they have a bigger following in the end? Like, before we get onto opposition, I want to know how wide mm. this network was, if it was. Yeah, so it was primarily uh, these four guys, mm. Baker, Battersby, Schneider, and Barlow. It was primarily them. Then we have mm. the three women, May and Joan, mm -hmm. uh, Joan Schneider, yep. who were the, the Schneider sisters. And then yep. they had actually converted one of their friends, uh, who was a oh. Wren with them, Angela Lincoln. They had converted mm -hmm. her and brought her to live in the, the house with them. And so all told, oh, it's about seven people. <laughs> but then we have, we have conflicting reports from different newspapers and all that kind of stuff. The numbers could be as high as 12, or, or as low as seven. Mm. 12 would be an interesting parallel, wouldn't it, to the disciples? But, I mean, it's oh, not a yeah. huge it's not a huge group, but a very dangerous group, even if it is small. Was there much opposition to them? Because how widely were they known about? Like, you know, people, you got to imagine, in the war, are just trying to literally survive and get through their day-to-day -day life. Like, yeah. wartime is insane. So then having to worry about these fascists, it's... I don't know. I don't know what the reality of that was. Yeah. So in terms of how well known they were, they ended up getting mentioned in Parliament four times. And oh, okay. they were even noticed in Soviet Russia. Wow. That's, okay. that's how widely they were known. But in terms of, of the more local scale, the more actual opposition, um, when they settled in at Kingdom House in Surrey, the village around them didn't accept them with open arms. They were quite unfriendly to these this? fascists. Um, so, I live in Surrey now, so I'm just wondering. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> Petworth. Mm. Yeah, so Petworth in Surrey. It's a, it's a little out the way kind of village. It's a town now, but it ah. used to be more of a village. 
Um, and so they were not accepted with open arms by any means. Um, they Good. Were, yeah, <laughs> because what, what we have to realize is that during this time, the war has just ended and everything that the British people had fought against, they thought they'd defeated. But mm. now they were starting to have a bastion of this Nazi ideology in their own town. This is just such a wild thought to these British people. We've just survived a war. We've just Mm -hmm. fought off this Nazi threat. We've defeated them. Their leader's dead. Surely they're done. Exactly. Still destruction. Like the war, even though the war ended in 1945, the realities of the war didn't, which is obviously what I just said. But like, that's what I mean. Like they're trying to survive. They're trying to find some hope, right? Yeah. And then you've got these four in a nice big house with a missing wife <laughs> like exactly ah. exactly and on top of that just down the road was petworth boys school and petworth oh, boys yeah. school had been bombed in 1941 accidentally bombs had been dropped on this school and killed countless schoolboys all the teachers oh they were in there that's terrible yeah. So they were in school when the bombs fell and the destruction was just unfathomable. So much death. And then up the road, you've now got a cult that are worshipping the guy that basically ordered this mass death. That's Um, terrible. Because you can imagine all the parents live there then and are still very much dealing with the death of their children. Because you don't imagine your children to be anywhere safer than at school, do you? Well, in the UK anyway. Um, Exactly. Exactly. So it was an awful situation. And that was highlighted in one of the original newspaper articles. Um, The writer gives this really heartfelt description of the memorial to the uh, Petworth Boys School and about how these boys had been killed by an off-target German bomb. And then he goes on to say about these people who were setting up a Nazi cult just up the hill. Terrible. It's awful. So how how did they get stopped? Yeah, so this is the thing. The opposition was very local, but then as they started to get more well-known, pastors from different churches started to get involved. And one of the most amazing stories is Pastor Victor Walker. And he was the pastor of uh, LM Foursquare Church. And he Mm -hmm. came down and drove up outside the gates of Kingdom House with massive loudspeakers (laughs) strapped to the roof of his car and started putting on a church service outside Kingdom House. Wow. He he played a hymn on the loudspeakers, uh, Jesu, lover of my soul, and he started to preach this sermon talking about how the Antichrist would come and the, the man of evil, the man of destruction... Uh, would come and he was basically likening Hitler Mussolini and now this new cult to the man of disorder the man of destruction the devil himself and so he was calling these guys out right in front of their headquarters and everyone started to come out of their homes there's this incredible image where even boy scouts on the nearby fields would run to the hedgerows just so they could see this pastor confront this Hitler cult. That's bravery. It's real it's bravery, massive, especially because these men are dangerous. Bravery. Like Exactly. Massive bravery from him. He starts doing this church service. And after he finishes his sermon, he sees May and Joan Schneider watching him from one of the windows in Kingdom House. And then the door opens and out walks Arthur Schneider. And he's carrying a tray of tea. And he walks over to Pastor Walker, sets down the tray of teacups on the wall and says, I'm really sorry that you can't come in, uh, but you can have your little tea party out here. (laughs) I mean, the sarcasm that seeps through these words. But it, it speaks to the way that the League the way that this cult viewed their opposition. They weren't afraid of 
a pastor coming to their gates and calling them heretics and blasphemers. They saw no threat from anyone, perfectly comfortable to live in their house and worship Hitler. Um, and so, you know, that that's one of my favorite stories from, from the League. But, yeah. I mean, but what eventually at least they were committed. <laughs> yes, yeah, quite, quite. Um, but what eventually brought them down was the most violent part of this entire story. Mm -hmm. uh, because in December 1945, 14 mm -hmm. masked men and women took it upon themselves yes. to end the cult. And so one morning they broke in to Kingdom House. They beat up Arthur Schneider. They tied him up, threw him in the back of the car. They stole a bunch of propaganda <laughs> and papers and all that kind of stuff from yeah. the house, scared the sisters who were in there, and then drove off. Mm. They went into Petworth Town Center, dropped off Arthur Schneider, left him on the green in the middle of the town, and drove away, never to be found. And so mm. this was the catalyst for the League now being mentioned in Parliament because this wasn't just, oh, there's some weirdos worshipping Hitler in a house. <laughs> it's now this is a, a proper issue because violence is starting. Is there going to be some sort of local civil war within Petworth between the, the inhabitants and this cult? It's just typical of a government, isn't it? Only getting involved at the very last minute. Like, ah, oh, pain. Um, so then what happened? So after the raid, uh, Baker, Thomas St. Barb Baker, the head of the League, he basically mm -hmm. puts out a statement and says, we've forgiven them. We're not going to take what? any legal action. Yeah, we're not going to take any legal action against these raiders. We're not going to do anything. We've forgiven them. And that that's crazy because you the fact thought... that they could take legal but the fact that they mm. could take legal action, like mm. no one was actually questioning their views and what they were doing. And they were like, Do you know what actually these these people that beat us up, we're gonna we're gonna let them off. It's like sorry, sorry. Yeah. Oh Yeah, well this is the thing is is the home secretary kept on saying we can't do anything until they've done something wrong. And technically, yeah. legally evidence. speaking they hadn't done anything wrong. They might have some really bad views. They might disagree with everything that Britain holds dear. But legally speaking, they hadn't done anything wrong. Hmm. You can't police people's beliefs, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's that's one of the freedoms that we enjoy in, in this Western hmm. civilization. Um, hmm. But that also meant that the League could exist for a few months. And so... This, this happens, the raid happens, Baker says we've forgiven them, we're not taking any action. But by the end of December, the League of Christian Reformers, this British cult that worshipped Hitler, disappears. Just, 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 just gone. gone. There is, there's no more evidence about oh. the activities of the League in the form that it was, and the first reports um, of Kingdom House being empty um, and completely abandoned were on the 12th of February, 1949. So there's a, a there's a bit of time, there's about four years where we don't know what the house was used for. But by the end of 1945, the League were no more. Wow. And what, what became of the house? Like what's happened to the house now? Because you, you said you visited. Yeah, so people live in it now. It's someone's like actual house. Yeah. And that, that's, oh, okay. that's kind of why I've been a little bit um, guarded with giving any information about the house of itself. Um, is of because course. someone lives there now and they don't want, on the one hand, fascists descending on them, trying to find this memorial to this cult. Um, but they also don't want the house to become a listed building hmm. or something like that where tourists and things yeah. like that will come. So I, I have that's been their life, a little right? bit guarded. Exactly. I've been a little bit guarded with the details of where it actually is, um, but yeah. We're taking a quick break from this episode to talk to you about BCAD clothing. Most of the time, history-themed hoodies and t-shirts are garish, 
childish, cheesy, in your face, and most of the time, frankly, unwearable. But BCAD clothing creates subversive, subtle, and stylish history-themed clothing that you can wear and not feel embarrassed about. They also use 100% organic, sustainable, and environmentally friendly cotton in all their items so that it's good for the planet as well. If you want to check out the full range, you can head to presenthistory.co.uk, press shop in the menu and explore. Okay, so that happened to the house. The league just completely disappeared. What happened to these men and women? Did they just disappear? Do we know what they did next? Yeah, so we have some reports um, of, of what these people did next. Um, okay. Baker and Battersby, uh, they headed off to South Africa where they set up an orange okay. farm. Um, they wanted to grow oranges in South Africa. Just like wholesomely growing oranges, nothing horrible. That, that's it. Just grow oranges. But and then... did they do that? Well, this is the thing. The South African government then <laughs> realised who they were and quickly deported them back to Britain. Okay, good. So yep. they were deported back to uh, Britain. Baker then no oranges moved for them. to Jersey, where he mm -hmm. then spent a life... Um, meeting with other prominent fascists and kind of building his network and keeping his network alive. But mm. we don't have much information about what he actually did, if he actually did anything. Um, okay. But Battersby, Battersby is an interesting one because it seems that after the league ended and after he was deported from South Africa, everything started to go downhill from him. We have loads of reports, loads of letters, loads of newspaper articles calling him out for not paying child support to his wife, his divorced wife, for their kids. And mm -hmm. so in that sense, financially, things have taken a downturn for him. Yep. But also mentally, it seems that he has yeah. some sort of psychotic break. Um, starting I think that to... happened before the war, Zach. <laughs> I think that was before <laughs> interestingly, interestingly, um, his daughter also said a, a similar thing. She she believed that he had some sort of psychotic break, maybe actually while he was interned in in the internment camps. Mm, um, but yeah, so he he goes uh, basically completely off the rails at this point. <sighs> he starts writing more works about how Hitler is Christ, um, and he still worships Hitler. But then he also goes further, believing that he can communicate with other followers of Hitler around the world using telepathy. Okay. Yeah. And then it goes further than that because... Um, oh, what are you going to tell me next? Yeah, in 1952, during the two-minute silence on Remembrance Day... He, no. he runs out in front of the cenotaph, uh, raises his arm in a Hitler salute, and shouts as loud as he possibly can, Heil Hitler. Yeah. Surely there's got to be lots of reports on that so there soon are. after the war. That is, that is dreadful. Exactly. And one of my, my favourite lines from the newspaper reports from that time was the reporter wrote... I'm glad that he was arrested because I fear what the crowds would have done to him. For sure, yeah. Yeah, that... Yeah. Terrible. So that was awful. And then it seems that his mental health deteriorated to such a degree that less than three years later, he committed suicide uh, by jumping into the Thames uh, where he was decapitated by a Merseyside ferry. Ah... Uh. See, I feel sad for him now, but it's, it's difficult. It's hard. That is, you know, terrible. But then what they were trying to do was terrible. But uh, yeah. Exactly. What about Arthur the others? Schneider. So Arthur Schneider, he headed out with his sisters, with his family uh, to okay. northern Rhodesia, otherwise known as Zimbabwe nowadays. Uh, he headed over to... Because his parents believed, didn't they? Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
So he converted his parents. They went out to Zimbabwe and we have no more information about him. Interestingly though, interestingly, after <laughs> I released my project, my multimedia project about this cult, I did get a number of messages from potential family members of Arthur Schneider. Wow. So that's interesting. I've stayed in contact with a, a, a couple of them. Um, what kind of messages? Like messages wanting to help? Messages wanting to disconnect from the narrative? Or A, a little bit of both. Um, some of okay. them were saying things like, I heard your project. I thought it was really good, really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I'm related to Arthur Schneider in, in whatever way it was. Yeah. Um, on the one hand, they would like to know more about Arthur Schneider and what I found out about him, because some of them didn't yeah. know much about him. And others of were course. saying, you got it absolutely right. I remember my mother saying that he was an absolute nutcase and that's my abiding memory of him. <laughs> um, yeah. So that it was it was mixed, but on the on the whole positive. But it's just interesting that, that they're kind of mm. reaching out. And then, like That's I good. mentioned earlier, the first report of Kingdom House being completely abandoned was in 1949. Yeah. So it all ended. Yeah. It's good for the house that it's been able to recover because a lot of times when historic things happen or, you know, murders or whatever, the houses just fall into disrepair and it's sad. So it, it's nice that the house has been given a new life um, yes. and that these people's families have been able to move on and, and you know, live happy lives. So... Because at the end of the day, at the most basic level, all of these crimes are committed by people, like real people. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly. a really good consideration. And, and it sounds like such a fascinating research topic. Um, and as Zach said, you can find out more on his present history site. He did amazing work on that. I have certainly found today's episode interesting and I'm sure you did too. Please let us know. Get in touch with us. Indeed. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode of Dark Britain.